This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the monthly public lecture of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Thank you for coming. Uh, My name is Carl Seff. I'm on the board of directors of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Our president, Alita Rutchik, is not feeling well tonight, and so I'm subbing. So this is what you get for a substitute. The Vegetarian Society is a not-for-profit volunteer organization founded in 1990 to promote human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education. That's what we do, vegetarian education. Tonight's lecture is being videotaped for broadcast on the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii weekly weekly television series entitled Vegetarian. It's now time for our special guest, We're delighted to welcome Dr. Milton Mills to Hawaii and to the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Dr. Mills lives in Virginia and is a practicing physician in the Washington, D.C. area, in general working in intensive care units. He is a graduate of the Stanford University School of Medicine and has an extensive background in nutrition research, focusing on the role nutrition plays in the development of chronic diseases. He also serves as the Associate Director of Preventive Medicine for the Health Policy Group Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Many people know that as PCRM. He has volunteered extensively throughout North America and is a nutrition health education video spokesperson for the Discovery Health Channel. Tonight, Dr. Mills will address the question Are humans designed to eat meat? Please welcome Dr. Milton Mills. Okay. Let's see. Let's see if we can get this back up. All right. I think we're ready to go. Again, thank you for inviting me. The title of tonight's talk is, Are Humans Designed to Eat Meat? And we're going to address that question from a couple of different directions. I hope that what you've gained from the first part of the lecture is that you don't, even if you're eating meat, you don't like it, which is why you try to make it look and taste like plants. So the question is, do you, are you really designed to eat it in the first place? Because I tell you, I've had many pets and I've watched a lot of nature shows and nobody has to season a piece of meat or antelope carcass to make a lion want to eat it. All right. Well, it is written, you shall eat the plants of the field. Well, what are the leading causes of mortality in Western countries such as the United States? Well, they're the things people are most concerned about. If you were to ask the average American, what are you concerned about? What do you think threatens your life? Probably number one on the list these days would be terrorism. On that list would be violent crime, plane accidents, and what I refer to as the scary disease du jour, du jour meaning of the day. And that's whatever they're highlighting on the evening news, be it SARS, hantavirus, bird flu, you know, cockroaches at the local deli. I mean, you know, whatever they're talking about today to try to scare the bejesus out of people. Well, you know, even with this issue of terrorism, which is obviously a very serious issue and that is affecting the world, The fact of the matter is that the worst terrorists here in America are a little girl with pigtails, a clown, a chihuahua, and a guy dressed up like a king, if you know what I'm talking about. 
Burger King, Wendy's, McDonald's, and Taco Bell have been responsible for killing more human beings than any other source, including all the wars that have ever been fought in the history of this country. But I digress. Well, I submit to you that if that previous list is where our concerns are with respect to our health, our priorities are misplaced, just like the lady in this slide. Now, the sign says, do not feed the animals. Her husband is being eaten by a crocodile, and she says, you're embarrassing me, Warren. <laughs> Clearly, her priorities are somewhat misplaced. The actual leading causes of death in America and other Western countries are cardiovascular diseases, cancers, stroke, auto accidents, diabetes, and obesity, just to kind of give you sort of the top few. This is important because experts estimate that up to 80% of the major diseases and premature death we see in this country could be prevented by changes in diet and lifestyle. That's a tremendous, tremendous statistic. Every year, over half a million people die from heart disease, another half a million die from cancers, and the toll from obesity, diabetes, and stroke, etc., again, is, is uh, astronomical. And to think that we could not only prevent 80% of those deaths, but we could also prevent people from suffering from the diseases in the per first place is a very profound uh, uh, point. And so we need to ask the question, what should we be eating? If the diet that we're eating in this country is making us sick and killing us, what should we be eating so that we can avoid these things? Well, I submit to you that what we need to do is to switch to a plant-based diet. Well, do I have any evidence for that? You came to the right place because I got a lot of it. What we're going to do now is we're actually going to do a comparison between animals that were designed to eat meat and those that are designed to eat plant foods. We'll see what kinds of anatomic and physiologic features are associated with those diets. Then we'll look at human beings to see where we fall in that continuum. Well, first of all, let's talk about feeding strategies and energy efficiency. Carnivores are optimized for predation. That is, they want to eat other animals. The problem is that other animals do not want to be eaten, so they tend to run away. So carnivores are designed to be very speedy and to have weapons that allow them to chase down and kill these other animals. Plant eaters, the herbivores, have a very different issue when it comes time for them to eat. Their food doesn't run away, it doesn't try to attack them because it's anchored in the ground. The issue for them is the fact that their food tends to be spread out over a wide area. So they have to move around, cover large distances to find enough of the appropriate food to eat. Therefore, they are optimized for foraging. That is walking around, finding their food, and eating it in a comfortable fashion. All animals must procure their food in an energy efficient manner. This seems like an obvious point, but it's one worth making. And that is to say that if you expend more energy trying to find food than you actually get from the food, you won't be around very long. So it's extremely important that if you're going to be a predator, you better be a good one because it's extremely hard to catch animals that are trying not to be caught. Furthermore, if you're a plant eater, you've got to be able to cover large distances without expending lots of energy because, well, plant foods, while they may be abundant, tend to be fairly calorie dilute. So you have to be designed to walk around, cover large amounts of ground while expending a minimum of energy. Carnivores, therefore, seek weak, diseased, or defective animals because, duh, they're easier to catch. Herbivores, by contrast, they don't want the scraggly, broke down, dried out food because that plant food is likely not to have a lot of nutrients. Instead, they want the lush, verdant, beautiful foliage because that's likely to have the greatest concentration of nutrients. Now, why do I make this point? Because we as human beings, I hope by the end of this lecture to have convinced you that in fact we are herbivores, but the problem that we bring to this earth is that we bring an herbivore mentality 
to our carnivorous habits. That is, we go out and seek the most beautiful, the healthiest, the most you know, gorgeous animals when we hunt or fish. And as a result, we are destroying this planet by depleting the gene pools of these animals that we prey on. So instead of being like the carnivores to strengthen the gene pool by weeding out the weak, sick, and diseased, we actually weed out the very best and thus weaken the overall gene pool and ultimately drive animals to extinction. Well, when you look at carnivores, the first thing you notice is that they're designed for speed because obviously they have to run and chase down the food they're trying to catch. So they are what I call torpedo shaped. That is, they are streamlined in a four-aft direction. They have what I refer to as an armored front because when they're running up behind an animal that they're trying to bring down, that animal is going to be kicking at them to try and keep them off. And so they have to have padding and, and other things up front that help protect them from being injured. They have forward deployed weapons, meaning that the teeth and the claws are right up there up front so that when they attack these animals, they're able to bring them down in an efficient fashion. Well, to facilitate that process, these animals are in a permanent runner's crouch. Now, we've all seen the Olympics or some foot race, and you know that right before the 100 meter dash starts, people kneel down in a crouch with their legs flexed so that they can spring up and accelerate at a very fast rate. Well, carnivores are actually permanently in a runner's crouch. Their joints are permanently flexed and they are permanently on their toes so that they can take off and race at a moment's notice. And here's some examples of what I'm talking about. You can see that this wolf has this armored front, a heavily padded shoulder. His chest cavity is protected by the rib cage. The vulnerable parts of this animal, the unprotected abdomen and the gonads, are way in the back. So that if an animal tries to kick him, it's likely to kick the shoulders or the chest where the wolf is unlikely to be injured. And clearly the claws and the teeth are right up front, those forward deployed weapons we spoke about. And this is just another example pointing out how these permanently flexed joints that I, I refer to and the fact that these animals are always on their toes. Their heel is about a third of the way up the leg. And some more examples of the carnivore body plan, again, showing these flexed joints, forward deployed weapons, armored front, and again, the vulnerable parts are way, 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 way in the back where they're relatively protected. Now, this is, uh, points out some things about carnivore limbs as compared to the human limb. The bones of the paws have been actually shortened and made more compact so that they can grab the ground and generate a lot of speed. Their wrist has become fused so that they have an efficient transfer from the ground up to the limb so they can accelerate at a very fast rate. In contrast, humans have relatively very long uh, digits uh, and a very mobile wrist, but our wrist is actually very weak, which is why we end up spraining it or developing carpal tunnel or even breaking our wrist uh, if we stress it too severely. And when you look at the shoulder joint in uh, carnivores, you notice that their clavicle is almost non-existent. And again, that allows a lot of freedom of movement when they're running or trying to swipe at prey, whereas with humans we have a huge clavicle that somewhat limits the mobility of our shoulder or actually directs our mobility in a, a different orientation. Well, let's look at the plant eaters. Now, I've divided plant eaters into two groups, the vulnerable plant eaters and the invulnerable plant eaters. By vulnerable herbivores, I'm referring to those plant eaters that tend to be preyed upon by carnivores. And these animals, the first thing you notice is that they're designed for foraging, meaning that their limbs are very straight, and instead of being, uh, having flex joints, they actually have very straight limbs. And what's, what, what is the importance of that? That means that when they stand up, it is their skeleton that is resisting the force of gravity, not their muscles. See, when the carnivores stand, they've got to use muscle energy to stand up, which is why if your dog or your cat is not actively running around, playing, or doing something, they go lay down because it costs a lot of energy for them to stand up. And if you want to get an idea of what I'm talking about, just try standing like this for more than five minutes. You'll find your muscles will start to ache because instead of your bones resisting gravity, it will be your muscles and you'll quickly find that they will become fatigued. So because these plant eaters have to walk around and cover all this distance to find food, they have limbs that are very straight, 
joints that are not flexed so that when they stand up, the resistance to gravity is being done by their skeleton, not their muscles. And these, some of these animals, animals are so well designed in this regard that horses, elephants, and other large plant eaters actually can sleep standing up because it takes them no, almost no energy just to stand. We saw that the carnivores were kind of on their toes to kind of help them run faster. The plant eaters have taken this a step further. That is, they have what is referred to as an ungular grade stance, meaning that like a ballerina, they are on point. So instead of being on the balls of their feet, they're literally on the tips of their toes. And this is an example of an antelope, again, showing the, the very straight limbs that I referred to. You notice that all of the muscle mass in the limbs is located up here near the joint, and the limbs themselves are very thin, which means that it takes much less energy to move them. Now, contrasting that with the invulnerable herbivores, you see that they, such as elephants and other large plant eaters, they too are designed for foraging. They have very straight limbs, but their limbs are very thick and heavy and work like pillars to keep up this massive bulk. Clearly, these animals are not designed for extreme speed because they don't have to run away from anything. Nothing is going to jump on a full-grown elephant. And nothing is going to mess with an elephant baby because elephants are social creatures and the mothers are, and aunts and, and other relatives are usually very close and will stomp the daylights out of any lion or other creature that messes with one of the baby elephants. These animals are not designed to run fast because they don't have to. You know, who's going to mess with them? And so they have a more plantigrade, that is, flat foot stance. Now, to just give you an example, this is an elephant skeleton and a cat skeleton drawn to scale. You see how straight the elephant's limbs are and how they're more under the body, whereas the cat's limbs are flexed, the cat is on its toes, and its four, uh, front limbs are actually at the front of the chest cavity as opposed to being under it. And again, flexed joints meaning it has to expend a lot of muscle energy to stand up. Now contrast that with human beings, we are definitely flat foot, our heel is on the ground, and elephants have also a modified flat foot stance, which would qualify as a plantigrade stance. Well, what about human beings? We also are designed for walking and foraging. We are lousy runners. We don't run very well at all. The fastest human beings can only run at about 22 to 25 miles an hour, and that's only for a couple hundred yards. Whereas the fastest plant eaters can run upwards of 40, 45 miles an hour for several miles. If you watch these uh, uh, animal shows, you know that a lot of time the antelope will go bouncing all over the, the savanna, and that's their way of telling a predator, don't waste your time chasing me, I'm in good shape, you're going you're gonna, to uh, end up losing. Well, humans also have what I refer to as an exposed anatomy. The vulnerable parts on our body are right up front where they can be severely damaged by an animal we're trying to chase down. And that just doesn't make sense if you are a predator. Furthermore, lifestyle factors make us relatively invulnerable to predation. So, yes, we are slow, we are plant eaters, but we don't have to be fast because the fact that we are able to be active during the hottest part of the daytime and the fact that we are social creatures like elephants and other herd animals helps us protect ourselves against predators. Most predators are actually asleep during the day and human beings would be asleep at night when most predators are active, which is why we have lousy night vision. Well, what about women? Obviously, human pregnancy makes hunting impractical. Well, how have theorists dealt with this? Well, they've come up with these theories now, and, and most of these theorists were guys, and they said, well, you know, the women hung out at the cave while the man went out to, you know, kill the bison and bring back the food to the home. And I'm sure that made them feel very proud, but it was also very impractical and inaccurate. The female of every species has always been able to procure the diet she needs to live and raise her young. There is absolutely no species on earth where the female of the species cannot acquire the diet she needs to eat 
and support a pregnancy and raise young. So to postulate that humans, that human females would need to eat food that they are unable to get for themselves is utterly ridiculous. And I always say, given how undependable males are in general and men are in particular, I don't think there's any woman, including Mother Nature, who would stake her survival on a man. <laughs> Furthermore, the long gestation of, the, of human pregnancy is typical of herbivores. Carnivores have very short gestation periods, usually less than three months, and this is because obviously a massively pregnant wolf or lion cannot hunt. So they tend to have very short pregnancies and their babies are born at, ver at a very immature state and at a very small weight. And again, they tend to have litters of babies, you know, with multiple births, whereas large plant-eating mammals tend to have single infants or maybe at the most twins. This is also obviously true of human beings, assuming you're not on fertility drugs. And what's also interesting is that in carnivores, the typical baby weighs less than 3% of the mother's body weight, whereas with herbivores, they have much larger children that tend to weigh 7 to 8% of the mother's body weight or more. And if you assume that the average human baby weighs seven to eight pounds. I personally weighed nine pounds, six ounces. I was born by cesarean, which is why my mother still walks. That is clearly about 8% of, of a, say, 110 pound woman's ideal body weight. So clearly we have the, the, the uh, classic characteristics of a plant eater in that regard. When we walk, our leg acts as a pendulum and it actually turns out that most of the energy for, using, for moving the human leg while we're walking is done not by muscles, but by gravity. It's a passive swinging motion. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the energy cost of locomotion. If you graft walking speed versus energy for all animals except humans, you get a straight line, meaning that the faster that animal walks, the more energy it has to use to move at that faster speed. Something very different occurs with human beings. With humans, over a fairly wide range of speeds, you find that we can walk faster for a much lower energy cost than one would predict for an animal our size. And this area within this curve represents the energy savings that we accrue. Well, how is it that we are able to be such efficient walkers? And again, keep in mind that walking is a foraging form of locomotion, not predation. Well, the reason we're such efficient walkers is that it has to do with the fact that we are standing upright. Our center of mass is actually sits on top of the, our, our pillars of support, that is our legs, and the minute you throw your leg out in front of you, your center of mass falls outside of your body and tends to pull you forward. And so what you do is you throw your leg out and catch yourself before you fall, pivot over that leg, and keep that process going. So walking for human beings is a form of controlled falling, which is why even if you stub your toe just a little bit, you almost fall on your face because you take yourself out of that unique equilibrium we get into when we're walking. And so what's actually happening is that gravity is helping us move. It is doing some of the work of moving our body and it makes us exquisite walkers. We're very efficient walkers but lousy runners. And again, walking is a strategy that is appropriate for gathering plant foods, but you know, you can't walk up on most animals and say, hi, I'd like to eat you. They, they, they generally won't have that. All right, well, let's talk about the head and neck region. In carnivores, you see that carnivores have reduced facial muscles that allows them to open their mouths very wide so they can run up and grab onto some animal and, and hopefully, uh, if they're lucky, take it down and have dinner. The main muscle operating their jaw is what's called the temporalis muscle, which is a muscle that sits on top of the head, inserts on the lower jaw, and pulls the jaw into, into its socket and keeps it very stable. This is important because, again, there are no ENT surgeons on the savanna. You get your jaw dislocated out there, you can't eat, you die. When you pet a dog, you are not petting that dog's skull. You're actually petting its temporalis muscle. All that huge bulge, that's all muscle. As we know, the teeth in carnivores are designed for ripping, tearing, and cutting. This is a picture of a carnivore skull showing that the jaw joint is in the same plane as the cheek teeth, 
And this allows the jaws to act like a pair of shears. So that when the lower jaw, the upper and lower jaw close, they close like a pair of shears and give you a nice cutting motion. Notice these huge blade-shaped carnassial molar teeth in the cheek. The upper teeth slide completely past the teeth in the lower jaw, which is what gives you that slicing motion, and that's what allows them to slice meat off of the bone. This area called the angle of the mandible is very, very reduced because the muscles that attach here in carnivores are very small. But the area where the temporalis attaches is absolutely huge. Now, what about the plant eaters? Well, plant eaters, by contrast, have very well-developed facial muscles. The main muscles operating the jaw are what are called the masseter and pterygoids. The masseters are the muscles that attach on the outside. The pterygoids are analogous and attach on the inside, and they hold the lower jaw in a sling-like arrangement, which allows them to move the lower jaw from side to side. Carnivores cannot move their jaw from side to side. We'll, I'll ask you later if you can move yours from side to side. But herbivores, the plant eaters, can. And this is just an illustration showing a horse, showing the, this is the masseter uh, muscle located on the outside. The muscle on the inside of the jaw is called the pterygoid. And, uh, and you see that they have a nice walled-in uh, oral cavity because of these well-developed facial muscles and nice fleshy lips that aid them in moving food into the mouth. I'd also like to point out that the incisors are shaped like little spades, which help them crop off plant foods so that they can be thoroughly chewed. Furthermore, in uh, herbivores, the jaw joint is above the plane of the cheek teeth, which allows the jaws to come together like a nutcracker. So you remember in the, in the meat eater, the jaw joint was on the same plane as the cheek teeth, which allowed the, the jaws to act like shears. Here, the jaw joint is way up here. Here are the, cheek, here are the, the molars. Jaw joint is up here gives you an L-shaped lower jaw, meaning that when the jaw closes, the upper and lower molars come together on top of each other as opposed to a slicing type motion. This area, referred to as the angle of the mandible, is nice and expanded, and that's where the masseter and the pterygoid muscles attach. And the molars are flat and nodular and useful for grinding up the food that they eat. There is a small opening into the oral cavity, and this allows herbivores to do something carnivores can't do. Herbivores are able to create a vacuum in their mouth so they can actually suck water into the oral cavity. Carnivores can't. They have to lap up water. How many people here lap up water when you get ready to drink? Huh? Okay. All right. As I said, the uh, molars in carnivores are known as carnassial teeth, and they're the key feature of the order carnivora, and they have these sharp, jagged edges, and they're shaped like basically little shaped steak knives, and they come together to provide a shearing surface to cut flesh. By contrast, in plant eaters, the molars are flattened to provide a grinding surface. The jaws operate very differently. In carnivores, the, jaws cl the molars slide past each other in a vertical motion, whereas in plant eaters, the molars slide across each other in a horizontal motion. The esophagus is the tube that leads from the mouth to the stomach. In carnivores, we find that the esophagus is very wide and distensible, which allows them to swallow huge chunks of meat without choking to death. In herbivores, the esophagus is different. It's narrow and muscular, and they can only swallow rather small balls of thoroughly chewed food. And that's also true of human beings. Our esophagus is narrow and muscular, and it turns out that over 90% of the people who choke to death every year choke to death eating meat, not plant foods. All right, looking at the upper gastrointestinal tract, what is it that, that meat eaters are eating? They're eating meat. What animal tissues are basically comprised of protein and fat? Animal cells have a cell membrane that's made up of fat, and inside the cell you find a bunch of protein and other easily digested items, and there is absolutely no fiber. As a result, these animals have very simple, short digestive tracts. The main feature of the carnivore digestive tract is the fact that they have gigantic stomachs. This is why your dog can eat all day long and still beg for more. Because their stomach holds 60 to 70 percent of the total gut capacity. Furthermore, when they have food in their stomach, it is extremely acidic with a pH of 
less than one, which is as strong as battery acid, and that's what allows them to eat bones and hooves and dissolve and absorb that material. Just so you know, the pH scale runs from one to 14, with seven being neutral. So anything that's less than, actually less than two or three is exceedingly acidic, and less than one, as I said, is equivalent to battery acid. These animal stomachs are so large that they are able to eat 30 to 40 percent of their body weight at one meal. That means that a 300 pound lion can consume 90 to 100 pounds of flesh at one meal. In order for you to do something like that, if you weighed 150 pounds, you'd have to be able to eat 45 pounds of food for breakfast. Nobody can do that. And that's because their stomachs are designed for intermittent feeding. Hunting is an inherently tenuous enterprise, meaning that these animals are successful in their hunts maybe one out of every seven to ten times. So they may only eat once a week. Therefore, when they actually are able to either make a kill or they come upon some animal that's already died, it is extremely important for them to eat as much food as they possibly can because they, they literally do not know where their next meal is coming from. That's one of the reasons they have these giant stomachs because they will eat you know, on the order of once every seven to ten days. Furthermore, they use their stomachs as kind of grocery carts. If you, again, if you watch these nature shows and you've looked at stories of wild animals, um, I mean, excuse me, wild dogs or wolves, you notice that when the parents come back from the hunt, the babies come out of the den and start yelping and licking them on the face, and that stimulates the parents to regurgitate food for the pups. That's one of, having these huge stomachs allows them to basically carry some of the flesh that they've, they've, they've consumed back to the den to feed the pups and any other and, uh, family members that haven't been able to go on the hunt. And when I finally realized that, it, it helped me understand something that I noticed uh, when I was a kid and I had a dog. I'd be out walking my dog and then I'd spit on the ground and the dog would run over and lick it up and I thought, that's disgusting. But then I realized that, oh my God, he thought I was regurgitating for him. It was really sweet. So, <laughs> The carnivore small intestine, which is the area where the actual absorption of nutrients takes place, is extremely short. It is typically only three to six times body length, averaging about four times body length. So if you have like, say, a six foot or, or you know, eight foot animal, that means that their small intestine is only about, say, 21 to 23 feet, or 24 feet in length. The enzymes that line the small intestine are primarily protein and fat digesting enzymes because these animals usually are not consuming very much carbohydrate. And they, in fact, have a very poor capacity to digest and absorb large amounts of carbohydrate. And studies done in the 50s showed that if you fed large amounts of complex carbohydrates to uh, dogs, you would end, end up giving them diarrhea because they could not digest and absorb it. And this is just uh, some diagram showing the digestive tracts of these various animals as a dog, cat, ard wolf, again, simple stomach, short, small intestine, short, long intestine, and again, we'll talk about a little bit more about that in a minute. Well, plants don't have bones. Anybody surprised to hear that? No. They use cellulose to resist gravity. But what that means is that all plant tissues are loaded with indigestible fiber, and that means that it is much more difficult to extract nutrients from plant tissues, so you need a much longer and more elaborate digestive tract to do so. Plant tissues require prolonged digestion, are composed of protein, fat, carbohydrates, and a fibrous cell wall. Every plant cell has a fibrous cell wall made up of cellulose, again, meaning that it takes a lot more work to extract nutrients from these foods. You have to actually try and mechanically disrupt those cell walls by chewing in order to get at the uh, nutritious parts of the plant cell. That it's important to realize that carnivores do not chew their food. They simply swallow it. And that's because there's no point. The purpose of chewing food is to mix food with digestive enzymes. There are no digestive enzymes in a carnivore saliva, so there's no point in chewing the food. They just want to get it down to the stomach where the acid and the pancreatic enzymes can actually begin the process of digestion. Well, not all plant eaters have multiple stomachs. And I point this out because, you know, people say to me, well, if I'm supposed to be a vegetarian, how come I have four stomachs? 
Well, sometimes you wonder, but anyway, I, that's a different story. <laughs> but not all herbivores have four stomachs. On top of this diagram you see is a picture of a zebra, and zebra, like all equines or, or members of the horse family, and many other herbivores like elephants and primates, like gorillas, monkeys, and humans, have just a simple stomach, a long small intestine, and an area in the colon called the cecum where we actually do fermentation of fiber. What is fermentation? Well, animals like antelope and cows, and etc., are animals that are designed to eat very rough herbage, plant food that has almost no intrinsic nutrient value that is primarily cellulose. And as a result, they need to, and no mammal makes an enzyme that will break down cellulose. So how can they eat cellulose and live? Well, in their stomachs is a soup that is made up of protozoa and bacteria that actually release enzymes that can break down the cellulose. And so that's why cows and antelope will go around and basically chew, you know, crop off a bunch of grass, swallow it, let it soak up those digestive enzymes, then they bring it back up and chew it, and that's called chewing the cud. Exactly. And that's to mix that grass with those digestive enzymes made by the bacteria. Then they swallow it and it goes into another stomach where digestion begins to take place. Now, the differences in these two schemes for digesting food can be appreciated by looking at the scat of these various animals. That's, you know, that's, if you're into jazz, you know, scat means one thing, but if you're into biology, it means something totally different. Um, <laughs> But if you've looked at horse scat, you notice that it's very firm and it has a lot of undigested fiber in it. But if you looked at cow scat, you know it's almost liquid. That's because, again, horses having only a simple stomach don't digest that fiber very well. So a lot of it passes through undigested, much like the corn some of us had last night. On the other hand, for the ruminants, such as the antelope and the cows, etc., that have these bacterial enzymes that can break down fiber, they are much more efficient at it, which is why their scat comes out in a liquid form. But interestingly, when you look at the herbivore stomach, it's much smaller than that of the carnivore. It only holds less than 30% of the total gut, gut capacity. It's only mild to moderately acidic. When they have food in the stomach, the pH of the food in the stomach is only about 4 to 5. And it is designed for batch feeding, not intermittent feeding, batch feeding, meaning these animals go out in the morning, consume a meal, then they spend part of the day digesting that meal, and then they go out later on and consume another batch of food. So they eat multiple times a day. Not once a week or once every 10 days, but multiple times a day. Starting to sound familiar. Even with the multi-chambered plant eaters, four stomachs combined hold less than 30% of their gut capacity. pH is neutral to slightly basic. Also, it's designed for batch feeding, and as I said before, it has that population of bacteria that helps break down the cellulose. Now, here's where the, the very big difference occurs. The small intestine in plant eaters is extremely long, averaging 10 to 12 times of the body length or more. Zebra has this peculiar pouched appearance, which is typical of uh, herbivores that eat a very fibrous diet. Well, what about the lower digestive tract or the colon? In carnivores, the colon is short, non-pouched, and that's because the only function is elimination. By the time meat residue gets to the colon, it has no nutritive value, and the only thing that will happen is that it will putrefy and release toxins into the animal system if it is not rapidly eliminated. And so once this residue gets to the colon, it's pretty much coming out. By contrast, the herbivore colon is long and often pouched and has multiple functions, including accessory fermentation of fiber. So herbivores have bacteria in their colons that actually partially break down fiber, and they can absorb nutrients called short-chain fatty acids from the fiber breakdown. But they also absorb water in their colon, and the bacteria there produce vitamins that they can absorb and that help uh, maintain health. And this is an example of a horse, the colon of a horse. This is the cecum, and then the colon is kind of wound up there, and this is the colon of a rhesus monkey. And again, you see that pouched appearance I referred to earlier. Well, let's touch on some physiolo physiology. 
Do carnivores worry about fat and cholesterol? No, they don't. Dogs do not get coronary artery disease no matter how much fat and cholesterol they're fed. The same is true for cats and other carnivores. And that's because lipoprotein metabolism, their livers, are able to clear this fat and cholesterol from their system with no problem. They never get heart disease from it. Furthermore, they don't get gallstones. Most of the gallstones that people get are made up of cholesterol, and that's because when we eat too much cholesterol, it has a tendency to precipitate out in our bile and form stones. Now, what is bile and what is it for? Well, most of the women here who've had children are at least familiar with what bile is. They may not know what it was for, but they know that bile is called bile because it rhymes with bile. I became familiar with bile when I tried to go out whale watching one day and the seas were rather choppy. Shortly after the ship passed under the Golden Gate, I retired to the bathroom and did not leave it until we docked. I saw not only everything that I had eaten that morning, but then I started throwing up this very bitter, nasty, yellow, foul-smelling liquid and I just was like, my God, what is that stuff? And it was bile. Well, what is the purpose of bile? Bile is a detergent. As you know, oil and water do not mix. So in order to absorb the fat in the food that we eat, we have to have some way of emulsifying that fat so that we can absorb it into our bloodstream, and that's what bile does. But just as you know that the dishwashing liquid that you buy at the store is not, all, all dishwashing liquid isn't created equal, neither is all bile. There's Dawn that has excellent grease cutting capacity. Then there's that cheap stuff that you wash two glasses and you got to put more di uh, detergent in the water. Well, again, carnivores have very strong bile that's able to emulsify a lot of fat and cholesterol, which is why they do not get gallstones. On the other hand, we have very weak bile because we should not be eating a diet that's very high in fat and cholesterol. And when we do, that, that fat and the cholesterol tends to do exactly what greasy dishes do. When you wash with cheap dishwashing liquid, the grease tends to collect, coalesce, and uh, in the case of cholesterol, it forms stones. Interestingly, one of the reasons that bare bile is used in traditional Chinese medicine is that people found years ago that if they drank bare bile, it would actually be absorbed and concentrated in their liver and it would actually dissolve the cholesterol gallstones that are there. Let me say that we now have medicines that do the same thing so we don't have to go around killing bears, but it's just interesting that there was that folk wisdom that realized that. Well, by contrast, only plant eaters have carbohydrate digesting enzymes in their saliva, an enzyme called salivary amylase that actually starts to break down the carbohydrates in the mouth as the food is chewed. Furthermore, only herbivores have an appendix. What? Isn't the appendix unnecessary? Isn't it like leftover from? No, it's not. We now realize that the appendix is part of the immune system that is associated with the GI tract. Now, I can't tell you whether or not people who've had their, immune, their appendix rem removed tend to have more lower GI infections or not because I'm not aware of any studies, but I would not be surprised if that turned out to be the case. Herbivores, plant eaters, cannot detoxify vitamin A. Preformed vitamin A is a fat-soluble vitamin that is stored in livers. As you know, carnivores eat a lot of livers, and they have to be able to take that vitamin A and break it apart so that they don't poison themselves to death. And they can do that, but plant eaters can't. On the other hand, beta carotene, which is a pigment that makes carrots orange and squash yellow and green leafy vegetables dark green, is a precursor of vitamin A, and plant eaters can take that beta carotene and convert it into vitamin A, but meat eaters, carnivores, can't. If you look at your bottle of multivitamins when you get home, what you're going to see is that the vitamin A, it will say, there'll be a little asterisk, and it'll say, in the form of beta carotene. That's because we can convert beta carotene to vitamin A. And lastly, plant eaters easily develop heart disease when they're fed diets high in saturated fat and cholesterol, which is why people use rabbits and rodents for heart disease research. And I'm not, approve, I'm not saying I approve of that. I'm just saying that's one of the reasons they're able to use these animals because they develop heart disease very easily if they're fed a lot of uh, fat and cholesterol. Well, what about us? Well, when you look at our teeth, you see that we have the classic spade-like incisors that are useful for cropping and peeling plant foods. Our canine teeth are so reduced in size that they essentially function as accessory incisors and are utterly useless for ripping or tearing any kind of meat and much of anything except an envelope.
when you look at our jaw, you see that the jaw joint in humans is well above the plane of the cheek teeth and giving us that L-shaped jaw of the plant eaters. The angle of the mandible is expanded and the primary muscles uh, that operate the jaw are the master and pterygoids, and I'll show you that a little bit later. And again, you see that our molars are flattened and nodular, useful for grinding. And yes, let's do it all together. Our lower jaw moves from side to side to side to side so that our molars slide across each other horizontally, not past each other vertically. When you look at the human facial muscles, we have well-developed facial muscles, small opening into the oral cavity, and that gives us that walled-in oral cavity, which allows us to use a straw to suck up liquid. We have fleshy muscular lips that really are designed to help us eat and move food into the mouth. I know you thought that they were designed for kissing. That's just a fringe benefit. Primary purpose is to help you eat. And the temporalis muscle, which is the muscle up here, is very small in humans. This view shows you the masseter muscles that I was telling you about. The masseter is located on the outside of the angle of the mandible. The pterygoids are located on the inside. So if you all put your hands right here and just kind of bite down, that, that jump that you feel, that's your masseter. The pterygoid is on the inside. And those are the primary muscles uh, that help you chew your food. And yes, we do have an enzyme in our saliva called salivary amylase that is responsible for the majority of carbohydrate digestion if we chew our food thoroughly. Well, as mentioned before, the human esophagus is narrow and muscular, can only handle small, soft bits of food. And again, when we eat stuff that we shouldn't eat, many of us end up choking to death every year because of it. The human stomach, we have a simple stomach that holds less than 25% of the total capacity of our GI tract. It's only moderately acidic with food, about four to five. Believe me, if your pH was less than four, you would be heading for the hospital. And it also is designed for batch feeding, which is why we tend to eat two to three meals a day. The human small intestine is extremely long, averaging 25 to 35 feet. I kind of stole my own thunder here because sometimes people say, wait a minute. If the human small intestine is only 30 feet long and I'm six feet tall, that means that my int small intestine is only five times my body length. No, nope. body length is measured from the top of the head to the tailbone, and in human beings that averages two and a half to three feet, so that our small intestine has the classic measurements of all plant eaters. The human test small intestine is actually much longer than, would even, than, than it appears because when you look at it on the inside, you see that the mucosa is compressed like an accordion and that increases the surface area. But then if you take a little section of this mucosa out and look at it, you see that it's thrown into these little projections called villi. And if you take a little piece off here and look at it under the microscope, you see that the villi have microvilli. And what the net effect is that the total surface area of the human small intestine is equal to that of a singles tennis court. So the next time you watch Wimbledon and you see Maria Sharapova running up and down the court, think to yourself, wow, all of that is in my belly. And the enzymes that are, that are in our uh, small intestine are a mixture of carbohydrate, protein, and fat digesting enzymes. Well, the human colon is also very long and has the classic pouched appearance of the other herbivores. Our large intestine actually starts on the right side goes up, across, down, and finally out. The middle section is cut out here. Again, has that pouch stru structure I spoke of. And as you can see, we have an appendix. And uh, our large intestine uh, is primarily responsible for absorbing water, fermenting fiber, vitamin production, and ultimately elimination. Now, is uh, the fermentation of fiber important in humans? Yes, it is. Because studies have shown that people who have low fiber diets are at higher risk for having problems like irritable bowels, ulcerative colitis, because the colonic cells, that is the cells that line the human colon, actually prefer to use those short chain fatty acids that come from the breakdown of fiber as their energy source. And that when you don't have enough of those short chain fatty acids in your diet, it can cause disease in the colon, including things like ulcerative colitis and so forth. And even in the absence of frank disease, if your colonic cells aren't getting enough energy, they sometimes can't hold on to each other as tightly as they should, and that can allow the uh, bacteria and or toxins to seep into your system and make you sick. 
Well, you know, somebody asked me the other night, well, what about technology? I mean, you know, we, we were able to, to design spears and, and hunt and, and all this sort of thing. Well, we don't hunt very well, and in the absence of high-powered rifles and stuff, we usually get our butts kicked by animals. But more importantly, uh, technology did not change our physiology. So even when we were able to develop efficient hunting technology, we still have the anatomy and physiology of a plant eater. And the second point here says, think about a pig on a plane. What do I mean by that? You can put a pig on a plane and make it go 600 miles an hour, but that does not mean it was meant to fly. <laughs> well, this slide says bad things happen when we eat the wrong food and foods. And the caption at the bottom reads, the dog ate my magnetic insoles. And as you can see, the poor puppy is, connected, is uh, stuck on the refrigerator. Well, low fiber diets cause a variety of problems, including diverticulosis, hemorrhoids, appendicitis, increased risk for colon cancer, diabetes, and other hormone-related cancers like breast and prostate cancer. What is diverticulosis? Well, diverticulosis are actually small herniations in the wall of the colon, and that's what these little bubbles are. And so it's just like if you attempt to pick up something that's too heavy, you might rupture the, your, the muscles in your abdominal wall. When your colon has to exert abnormally large amounts of pressure to move stool through, it can cause herniations in the muscle walls, uh, in the uh, muscle wall of the colon. Well, what causes it to basically strain? Having a low fiber diet. Think of it like a tube of toothpaste. When the tube is brand new and full of uh, toothpaste, easy to squeeze that toothpaste out. But as it gets emptier and emptier, you have to exert more and more pressure to get the residue out. Same thing is true with your colon. If you don't have enough fiber in your diet, the colon has to squeeze very hard to try and move the uh, low residue stools through, and that can cause it to form these little ruptures. And if you get fecal material trapped in them, then they become infected and you have diverticulitis. And sometimes those other things will burst and you have peritonitis, which requires surgery and in-hospital antibiotics. Now, hemorrhoids can be thought of as essentially varicose veins of the lower rectum. There are a number of veins that basically drain the lower part of the digestive tract and flow direct blood back up through the heart right under the uh, mucosa of the rectum, but anything that causes pressure in the abdomen to become elevated and remain elevated causes blood to back up in those veins and that's why they become torturous like varicose veins and they can get infected and start to bleed. This is also why many women have a problem with hemorrhoids when they're pregnant because they have a huge amount of pressure in their abdomen called the baby but once they deliver the, the baby the problem often clears up but again the treatment for this is to increase the amount of fiber in your diet because the more fiber you have in your diet the less your intestines have to strain to move stool residue through and the lower the pressure in your abdomen. Well, this is called fast food madness. He says, I'll have the half pound double deluxe bacon steer burger, please. And the clerk presciently asks him, would you like some chemotherapy with that? <laughs> I, I just love the look on the clerk's face. <laughs> Animal fat and protein have been linked to, a, to just a plethora of health problems, including heart disease, obesity, cancers of the breast, prostate, colon, lung, and pancreas, both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, gallstones and kidney stones, increases the risk for dementia and Alzheimer's disease, osteoporosis, infantile iron deficiency anemia, cataracts, and gastrointestinal problems caused by infectious agents. By contrast, vegetarian diets are much healthier for us. You have less heart disease, over a 50% reduction in all-cause cancer mortality, lower blood pressure, less osteoporosis both before and after menopause, reduced risk of stroke, less obesity, less chronic disease, decreased incidence and severity of type 2 diabetes, tend to live longer, we have improved immune system function, increased level of energy, higher levels of, the, of natural antioxidants that protect against disease and help our body function better, a greater sense of well-being, and of course a reduced impact on the planet as a whole. Now, am I just blowing smoke or do I actually have evidence for these things that I'm telling you? The information I'm going to present to you now is taken from a study of uh, Seventh-day Adventists in California. 
and compare the Seventh-day Adventists of California to uh, California residents who are non-Adventists. And what's, what's uh, important about this is that roughly 50% of the Seventh-day Adventists are vegetarians and 50% aren't. So, and this data actually doesn't stratify them apart by their diet, it just lumps them as a, as a whole. So I actually think that if you could break, uh, uh, separate the meat eaters from the plant eaters, you see that the vegetarians are actually doing even better. But the point is that at every age from 45 through 74, both for Adventist males and Adventist females, they have less heart disease because of their diet, because in other respects they are pretty much like the rest of the population. And there's this, this is also true for cancer risk with the exception of prostate cancer, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But again, as you can see, for each cancer type, if the risk for non adventists is listed as one, the risk for breast, colon, bladder, stomach, kidney, and lung cancer was much was uh, significantly less for the Adventists. Now, the, uh, as you can see, for the prostate cancer, it is exactly the same as that for the non-Adventists. And the inter interesting question is, well, why is that? Why is it that their diet hasn't had as good an impact on prostate cancer? And I think the reason is, it's because most of the Seventh-day Adventists are lacto-ovo vegetarians, meaning that they include dairy foods in their diet. And dairy food has been linked to an increased risk of prostate cancer. So I think that that may be the reason we don't see the reduction that we see in the other types of cancer. And so hopefully at some point they will separate uh, the vegetarian groups by uh, vegans versus non-vegans. And, uh, and I think we will see a reduction in uh, an even greater reduction in cancer, including prostate cancer. The study also showed that there was a tremendous uh, impact on improving longevity. The Seventh-day Adventist men in California lived an average of 9.5, nearly 10 years longer than non-Adventist men. And the women lived uh, more than six and a half years longer. And again, that's an average, meaning that some of them did much better than that. Now, does that mean that the being a vegetarian isn't as good for women as it is for men? No, it's just that women already live so much longer than men. You guys just don't derive as much as, as, as much of a, of a lengthening of your life, but you guys are doing great too. This is a study that is actually a fairly old study. It was actually done back in the 70s. But what I like about this study is it also looks at Seventh-day Adventists, but it does break them down by vegetarian versus non-vegetarian. And it looks at the risk of a variety of diseases. And basically, this is a, a chart for females. You can see that uh, only 4.5% of the vegetarian women had a problem with heart disease versus 66 of the meat eaters, and half of them had an uh, uh, issue of stroke, uh, high blood pressure was less, and so on down the line. This is also true for the men. In closing, I just like this little foresight cartoon. It's God on the game show. It says, yes, that was right. The answer is Wisconsin. Another 50 points for God, and uh-oh, looks like Norman, our current champion, hasn't even scored yet. And what's funny to me about this slide is, you know, you kind of would say to yourself, well, Norman's an idiot. Who would go up against God? God knows everything, assuming you believe in God. Well, I'll close with this. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. Now, since everybody has a question, I'll open the floor to questions now. And for those of you who can't read the caption, it says, I don't mean to be callous, Earl, but can I have your stereo? Thank you. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344, or visit our website at www.vsh.org, vsh.org.